when you work out, you don't actually build muscle or increase muscular strength during your workout. The, the gains that accrue from working out, whether it's building muscle or gaining muscular strength, actually happen after you work out during the recovery period. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen articles and videos telling people to train, uh, and I've seen this myself in the gym, where some people will train the same muscles every day, sometimes as often as seven days a week. That, that is ridiculous, it makes no sense, and they're not gonna make any gains whatsoever because there's three, there's three aspects involved in gaining muscle mass. One of them is called mechanical tension. The other, the other one is called muscle damage. And, and the third one is uh, called metabolic, um, <laughs> metabolic, I don't remember the exact, metabolic stimulation, something like that. Anyway, the point is that when you work out with, especially with resistance training, you're actually damaging your muscles. You're damaging the muscle fibers. It takes, it takes a little bit of time to repair those muscle uh, that muscle fi fiber damage. And, uh, and by the way, if you're not working out and you're not causing any muscle damage, well, then, then you're probably maintaining muscle, but you're not really causing any increase in muscle mass because when the, bo when the uh, body repairs the muscle damage, it involves muscle stem cells called satellite cells Basically, I don't want to get into a whole technical spiel here. Suffice to say that the body compensates for muscle damage by thickening the individual muscle fiber, and that, that basically is muscular growth. However, the most important factor for increasing muscle is mechanical tension, which is the amount of tension applied to the muscle. That usually involves uh, uh, related to exercise intensity, uh, how long you do each rep, uh, these people that you see in the gym, you know, they, they throw the weights around. There's no mechanical tension there. I mean, all they're doing is using, they, they're not really working their muscles. They're just throwing the weight up, uh, you know, th so they're not going to make much gains. They're wasting the time. Uh, but that's not the point. The point of this video that I want to talk about is muscle recovery techniques. What are the, what are the recovery techniques that actually work uh, to increase? Uh, first of all, how long should you rest between each workout? Well, over the years, uh, I found from my personal experience and also from documented medical studies that you could, the smaller muscles, you, you, sh uh, you should need, they need about maybe 48 hours rest, or in other words, every two days, something like that. Larger muscles, because they're, you know, they, they, well, larger muscles like the back and legs, they require a little bit more rest, about 72 hours. Some people work their calves every day because uh, they're under the impression that the calves are a tough muscle and you need to work them every day to break it down. Now, the ca it's true that the calves are harder to develop, but they also don't need to be worked every day. Years ago, when training the calves every day was a popular fad in bodybuilding, when I was in bodybuilding competition myself, I did train my calves six days a week. I did up to 30 sets. I was uh, at my peak... Uh, period in my life of muscle growth in my early 20s and I did make some gains in my calves for the first two months but after that I, lo I rapidly lost size by the third month all the size I had gained from training my calves six days a week had regressed back to the way they were before it was they were completely overtrained I burnt the muscle away so that's about uh, that yeah so you have to have give time recovery involves enough time between workouts don't believe those stupid videos where they're telling people there's no such thing as overtraining you can work out every day every muscle that's nonsense i do see people doing this morons who come to the gym and i see them training the same muscles every day and i can absolutely verify i've seen these people for maybe two three years or longer they never make any gains at all they never change they don't get stronger they don't get bigger muscles they stay the same now, if that's all you want, if you, all you want to do is maintain what you have, then go ahead and train that way. But if you're interested in making gains, you've got to have sufficient rest and recovery. Now, one of the controversies about recovery is protein. Uh, years ago, there was a researcher named John Ivey. He came out with a study, where uh, actually a number of studies, where he suggested that if you take a protein drink, you should take a protein source, a protein drink, preferably a, a rapidly absorbed protein such as whey. You should ingest that as soon as possible after the workout. And you should also take it with a certain amount of rapidly absorbed carbohydrates. 
the purpose of combining the carbohydrates with the protein was the, carbo the, the carbohydrates would stimulate an insulin response greater than the amino acids from the protein alone. And in other words, you get like a 37% increase insulin uh, release from the added carbohydrates. And he said that would uh, promote increased uh, muscle growth rather than taking the protein alone. Over the years, uh, other studies, however, have shown two things. First of all, you don't need to ingest carbohydrates with whey protein because some of the amino acids in whey protein, such as leucine and a couple others, are very potent stimulator, stim, stimulus of insulin itself. doesn't require any added carbohydrates. You get enough of an insulin stimulation from just consuming the protein. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that, that's the first aspect. Uh, the second thing, as far as taking the protein, uh, Dr. Ivey suggested you take the, he, he called it an anabolic window. He said there was a period of about two hours after a workout where enzymes in the muscle were primed, where you would get a better anabolic effect if you consume protein right after the workout. Now, I still see this. I still see people at the gym, they, they uh, make a protein drink. As soon as they get off the gym floor, uh, I guess they have this notion that taking protein that fast is going to cause increased muscle growth. Unfortunately, studies have looked at that, and what they found over the years is that muscle protein synthesis, which is a cornerstone of muscular growth, occurs over a 24 to 48 hour period. So what that means in, in basic uh, terms is that it, as long as you ingest enough protein 24 to 48 hours after you work out, that's all you need. You don't have to chug down a protein drink immediately. You don't have to keep it in your car, in the trunk of your car, anything like that. You, as long as you take in protein, uh, within the uh, enough protein, within 24 to 48 hours after a workout, that ma that maximizes uh, muscle muscle growth gains. Now, uh, they did they did show some studies showing that older uh, uh, trainees, meaning over 40, probably might benefit from taking in a little bit, uh, you know, taking more protein within, you don't have to take it right after the workout, but within 24 hours, you should maximize the protein rather than wait 48 hours. That's if you're over 40. Now, how much protein should you eat? Most of the research, uh, most of the research suggests you should ingest, for muscle building purposes, 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds of body weight. Uh, m many studies have shown that 1.6 is the ideal uh, amount of protein to stimulate muscle growth for anybody. You can go up to two point. Uh, you can go up to two grams of protein if you want. The only time the protein intake changes is if you're on a restricted diet, either calories, carbohydrates, or both, in which you need to increase your protein intake, because when you when you restrict calories or carbohydrates there's a slight chance of, of losing, well, not a slight chance, a good chance of losing lean mass on the diet. You lose, mu you lose body fat, but you also lose muscle, and protein kind of acts as a break. So under, under dieting conditions, you want to ingest as much as 3 to 3.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And don't believe the nonsense, which I also see on YouTube videos and in blogs, about how excess protein can make you fat. Absolute nonsense. Absolute bull total nonsense. I mean, it should be obvious that that's a lot of crap. First of all, excess protein, unlike carbohydrates and fat, excess protein in the form of amino acids, it's oxidized. Your body gets rid of the, nitric, uh, the, the uh, nitrogen portion. It converts it into urea in the liver, and it's excreted through the kidneys. You don't, you don't get fat from protein. The idea that you get fat from protein is because a gram of protein pr supplies four calories, Gram of carbohydrate, four calories. Gram of fat, nine calories. So according to these people that push this idea, uh, calories from any source in excess will make you fat, but it doesn't work like that in the body. Uh, in, all, in, my, in my 60 years of training, I have never seen a single person, not a single person, ever get fat from eating excess protein. Now, eating 300, 600 grams of protein, that kind of stuff, it's not going to build you more muscle. But it's not going to be converted into fat. That's complete nonsense. In fact, a couple of years ago in a major medical journal, they tested two types of diets in people that were sedentary. <clears throat> These people weren't even working out. One group, they had them on a, a low calorie. They both were on uh, uh, restricted diets. 
but one group ate, uh, consumed about two times more protein than the other. Now, the results of the study showed that both groups lost weight, but the people that consumed the extra protein, in other words, more protein than they actually needed, not only did they get fat, but they lost more body fat than the people that had, let's say, lower protein intakes. So protein does not make you fat. Anyone who tells you that, walk away from them, don't listen. They're, they're just ridiculous. What, should you take in protein before you work out? Uh, will that help your muscle recovery? Well, not really. In other words, uh, the you don't use protein uh, during your workout. <clears throat> your your uh, primary fuel sources <clears throat> in anaerobic exercise, such as typical resistance training bodybuilding, is muscle stored muscle glycogen and circulating glucose. Your body only uses protein in situations where the uh, glycogen stores or the glucose levels are low, then your body will start to use protein. And it's theoretically, you could actually take it right out of the muscle as branch chain amino acids. That almost never happens. That would only happen if you train, if you uh, were on, let's say, a, a low carbohydrate diet and you train like five or six hours straight. Uh, you know, you, then your energy stores would be depleted after about two hours. And then there was a chance that you could be burning protein as muscle. But that n never happens because only a moron would train six hours. That's ridiculous. That makes no sense at all under any circumstances. So if you want to take protein pre-workout, if it makes you feel better or, or you get a psychological effect, fine. But it's not going to contribute to muscle recovery. Uh, carbo what about carbohydrates after workout? Well, carbohydrates are the main fuel source to replenish depleted glycogen. And when you lift weights, as I, said, as I mentioned, muscle glycogen is your primary fuel for bodybuilding workouts. The, the amount of muscle glycogen in your muscle is not dependent on what you ate two hours before the workout or whatever. Muscle glycogen depends on what you ate 24 to 48 hours uh, before the workout. In other words, it takes time for the body to synthesize glycogen from mainly carbohydrates. So taking in carbohydrates after a workout is a good idea to uh, replenish depleted glycogen. Uh, most bodybuilders don't work out long enough or hard enough to completely uh, deplete their muscle glycogen levels. But you know, recent studies show that even just three sets of a high intensity set of, of weight training exercise can actually deplete the muscle glyc muscle glyc a lot more than they previously thought. They previously thought that the maximum uh, depletion of muscle glycogen when you worked out was about 48%. Now they say it could be up to 70, 80%. So, you know, muscle glycogen is involved in muscle recovery. You know, having a, a sufficient amount of glycogen in the muscle does aid muscle recovery. Among other effects, uh, having uh, carbohydrates or, uh, you know, building your muscle glycogen actually stimulates an anabolic hormone in muscle called insulin -like growth factor one which plays a huge role in muscle recovery by stimulating satellite cell or muscle stem cell activity now if you work out twice a day some bodybuilders work out for example before a contest they'll divide their workouts into two uh two workouts uh, in that situation carbohydrate after the workout becomes far more critical uh, in that situation if you're going to train twice a day it's a good idea to have a sufficient amount of carbohydrates right after the workout uh, to because uh, if you wait let's say four or five hours you're going to get a par uh, a uh, pretty uh, partial um, glycogen compensation effect that'll help you in your second workout uh, but other than that taking in carbohydrates is good for definitely good for recovery uh, you want to uh, for recovery don't eat ultra processed foods you want to get your carbohydrates from natural carbohydrate sources uh, usually the, that sources that contain fiber such as fruits and vegetables uh, <coughs> you want to when you eat fat stick to healthy fats like extra virgin olive oil avocados nuts seeds that type of thing it's also very important to stay hydrated especially in warm water you want to drink uh, at least 1.5 liter liters of water for every kilogram lost during exercise that's usually about three cups of fluid for every pound lost as, and of course, in hot weather or under humid conditions, you're going to sweat a lot more. You're going to lose water. You're going to lose some minerals. So it's very important to always stay hydrated. Drink water. Don't restrict water. Some people think ger uh, drinking cherry juice uh, might help muscle recovery because it reduces inflammation, muscle damage, and helps resolve muscle soreness. 
there is some uh, there is some truth to that, but the effect is minor at best. It, it's not it's not what some people make it out to be. If you want to have some cherry juice, fine. Uh, I noticed in one video Arnold Schwarzenegger was making a protein drink and he added cherry juice. He says because it's for recovery. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Creatine monohydrate. A lot of people wonder about creatine monohydrate. Uh, creatine monohydrate is uh, helps actually restore muscle glycogen. So in that sense, it definitely will help muscle recovery. It also seems to help reduce muscle damage and inflammation. Uh, a lot of people wonder when is the best time to take creatine supplements before or after the workout. Actually, uh, it's, it, it depends on, on uh, you, what you, what you want to do. However, glycogen is somewhat depleted during your training. So a couple of studies have suggested that if you're going to take glycogen, I mean, if you're going to take creatine once a day, take it after your workout. It doesn't have to be immediately after workout, but after your workout will actually replenish the glycogen used up during the training session. As far as the form of uh, creatine, forget all these high-tech creatines, all these, you know, creatine nitrate and creatine this. None of them are better than a basic creatine monohydrate, which is which is 99% absorbable. Creatine monohydrate contains the greatest amount of actual creatine. It's 87% creatine. A lot of those fancy creatine products aren't even 50% creatine. So, Stick with creatine monohydrate. It's the least expensive and the best form of creatine. Uh, if you're not getting enough protein in your diet, you might consider a protein powder. So whey, whey protein being the best. You want, uh, uh, sleep is very important for recovery. You want to have a minimal seven hours of sleep. Uh, eight, eight to nine hours would be ideal. As soon as you go over nine hours, strangely enough, the uh, health effects of sleep start to reverse. Uh, a little known fact about sleep is that if you don't get enough sleep, like some of these people go on four or five hours sleep, what happens is you uh, increase the uh, release of a gut hormone called ghrelin, which greatly stimulates your appetite, makes it very, very difficult to stay on the diet. And you also, at the same time, decrease another gut, uh, or well, actually a fat cell hormone called leptin, which actually helps you control your appetite. So not getting enough sleep will actually contribute to gaining body fat. Uh, what about sports massage as a recovery modality? A couple of studies show that uh, massage has a small but significant effect uh, and it might slightly decrease muscle soreness. Not a major effect. I wouldn't depend on massage as a uh, major recovery uh, mot uh, factor. Uh, some people wear compression garments. Uh, they, uh, one 2019 study showed that wearing compression garments uh, lowered the time for muscle recovery in German handball players. Uh, you know, they, the, in the study, the athletes wore the garments for 24 hours and then alternated between 12-hour breaks and 12-hour periods of wearing them for 96 hours. You know, you could try it if you're, I personally, I, I'm not big on compression garments, you know. Uh, cryotherapy, which is uh, exposing your body to extremely cold temperature, one of the worst things you could do for muscle recovery. The, you know, I, I, see, I still see people pushing this. Numerous studies have shown if you expose your muscles to cold therapy after a workout, it actually inhibits, it blunts muscle protein synthesis. In other words, it actually blunts muscle gains. Never expose your muscles to, uh, to cold immediately after a workout. And it has to do with a constriction of blood vessels. There's a lot of factors why. But now if you want to use cryotherapy, as, as it's called, a couple of hours after the workout, that's fine. Uh, it could be useful for reducing pain and inflammation. But never, ever expose your muscles to cold, no matter what you see or hear, right after the workout. One of the worst things you could do. Some people wonder about drinking alcohol. Uh, after, uh, after why I don't know why alcohol would be ever considered a recovery uh, substance I don't know because alcohol is a muscle toxin it actually breaks down muscle and the type of muscle it breaks down are the type 2 muscle fibers which are most amenable to muscle strength and size gains ridiculous of course smoking is just as bad smoking is associated with increased risk of connective tissue injuries and joint disease so you don't want to smoke at all uh, so I think I think that's really that's good. I think this is a good overview of, uh, of muscle recovery factors. So 
uh, don't ignore these factors. They're very important. Uh, I would put sleep really almost at the top of the list because without sleep, you know, uh, not just the fact that you will be more hungry and have much more difficult staying on a diet, but uh, when, you, when you don't get enough sleep, you, you, even if you're a young man, uh, they did a study of 19-year-old men. At 19, a man's testosterone is at the highest peak it will ever be in his life. They, had, they put these men in a sleep deprivation study where just one, losing one night of sleep cause their testosterone levels to plummet by 15 to 20 percent so not getting enough sleep is and also it causes insulin resistance insulin is uh, acts as a anti-catabolic effect in muscle helps prevent uh, excess muscle breakdown so i would put sleep as uh, uh at one of the t- at the top of the list along with obtaining sufficient rest between workouts again i repeat don't listen to the idiotic videos and I've seen quite a few of them where they say you could train any particular muscle every day, and that includes abdominals. The notion that training your abdominals every day will lead will lead to less fat, uh, you know, less uh, uh, smaller waist, greater muscle uh, de- uh, definition in the abdominal. That's nonsense. That's spot reducing. It's it's just bull. All you're doing is burning calories. You would get just as much benefit by doing a half hour of aerobics as doing a thousand sit-ups. Actually, more benefit. Because the aerobics directly burn fat systemically, uh, the doing ab, ab work w- isn't going to burn much fat at all. So don't believe that stuff. This is this is old stuff that's been passed down over the years because guys did years ago in Arnold's era. Some of the bodybuilders like to do high rep abdominal work, a thousand rep. It, nobody really knew what they were doing. I mean, they saw guys who, who who were doing that that had great abs, and they figured, well, that must be the way to do it. You got to do th- a thousand reps a day of ab work. That's utter nonsense. The, the degree of defin- muscular definition in your abdominal area is dependent on diet more than anything else. Uh, I've seen bodybuilders, elite bodybuilders, not do a single sit-up leg raise or any other abdominal exercise. They simply went on a diet, whether it's restricted calories or low carbohydrate, and their abdominals came out in bold relief. They had great abs without doing a single rep of abdominal work. So I'll leave it at that. If you want to have more information on nutrition, exercise science, anti-aging research, ergogenic aids, hormone therapy, such as testosterone replacement therapy, uh, women's health and fitness, um, I cover more topics in applied metabolics than any other digital uh, publication on the entire internet. It's 30 to 45 pages every month, no ads, written in plain English. I've been a writer for over half a century. (laughs) I know how to write for the public, unlike a lot of other digital publications which have good information, but you have to have a medical dictionary to understand what they're saying because they don't know how to write for the public. These people are are used to writing doctoral dissertations, and they never learned how to write write, uh, so that the public can understand. You won't find that with applied metabolics. It's a very useful educational tool. It'll prevent you from making some of the mistakes I made over the years. So subscribe today. It's at www.appliedmetabolics.com. When you subscribe, send me an email. I'll send you uh, an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where each day I post new information on nutrition, exercise science, and general health. I have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics webpage where subscribers only can send me short questions about anything they read or anything that interests them regarding nutrition and exercise, and I will be glad to answer them in appreciation for their subscription. Uh, obviously, I, will not, I, I only answer questions submitted to me by current subscribers. So again, it's www.appliedmetabolics.com. If you want to have the best fun you'll ever have, go to your local shelter and adopt a dog. Thank you.